please spread the word about my shows. I'm an independent creator and I would really appreciate it. I make K-pop guides, as well as I have exclusive interviews with songwriters, journalists, the artists themselves, best new music roundup episodes, artist-specific deep dive episodes, episodes about the history of K-pop, all sorts of content is covered. So to get your fill and support an independent creator, please check out 17 Karat K-pop wherever you get your podcast and view an episode guide at howtostand.substack.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to 17 Karat K-pop an enormous amount of news to cover today, so we are just diving right into it, especially because I'm starting a new segment on the headline roundup episodes of the show. Instead of just one-offs, where I really dive deep into a specific new K-pop release, I think, has a lot of meaning to it and is worth really stopping to appreciate, I decided to just do that every week, with a new release. And what better way to start off a new segment of the show than with Seventeen? So this week's shout out, we finally need to talk about June's new solo, Limbo. Then we'll get to the enormous amount of news there is to get to. June's Limbo was such a delightful surprise, especially because his last comeback was Silent Boarding Gate and Crow. Those were ballads, just showed his college boy vibe, just this wholesome, sweet, simple style, a love story, just a complete 180. Well, he really proved he can set the mood with sound in Silent Boarding Gate with the nature sounds, sounds of water, the feel like you're on a nature walk, and his gentle vocals. Now he works with this really dark, dramatic soundscape, this alt-rock electronic vibe, and his voice is really interesting in how it does pull you into the story, where he's kind of murmuring in a hushed tone at times, and other times really belting out the chorus. In a way, he's, with this vocal performance, proving how many multitudes he has. Both the fact he's doing this song does that, and this song itself. I also find his storytelling with this video to be really well done and interesting. There's his outfit, first of all. He looks so good as a platinum blonde, and the difference between black and white outfits is notable, especially because there was a black and white outfit duality in some past Seventeen work, like My Eye. But then at the end, he opts for a printed suit, so he breaks the binary at the end, becomes his own person. There's also the play on words here, and that applies to his choreography too. He did say intentionally he put that move in the choreo where it's like he's playing limbo, like the party game. He also ensured laser points were part of the video. He said he really wanted that element in there for some light fun. Those details together really combine to show his inner child is still intact. But he's also talking about a mature, romantic type of limbo. The word limbo here referring to the game, but also referring to this force that is pulling you under. The lyrics play with this interesting mix of connotations attached to limbo, because he's singing, Welcome to my lost world, do you want me to set you free? But the lyrics also show his more vulnerable side, and that side that's still like a, an innocent, curious, confused, still learning, still growing little kid. He's saying, I just want to set you free, after he said, do you want me to? So he's in control, then he's not in control, back and forth. Then he talks about, I bite my lip, trying to see if this is real. Like, he doesn't know what control he has over this lust anymore. This limbo he's in control of also controls him. He sinks deeper and deeper into this limbo state, this suspended in the current emotional dilemmas state. It's a really artful way to, ironically, show the dynamic side to living in limbo. He did confirm he drew a lot of inspiration from movies. Just broadly, the dynamic between main characters who end up in dangerous situations because of this blind trust in each other, blind lust, carelessness that comes from being lovesick. He also drew inspiration from Greek mythology. Shameless plug, check out the music and mythology episode of the show if you want more of those stories, where I talk about one of the common go-tos in K-pop for mythology inspiration, the story of Narcissus. He alludes to it with staring into the water, like Narcissus stared into his own reflection and fell in love with it. So whose limbo is he ultimately trapped by? Maybe it's his own. Maybe he is in this power dynamic, higher and lower. This is all an internal conflict. He finds a very catchy, unique, sonically and visually way to bring to life. Aside from the stellar wardrobe, play on words, the choreography, the nod to Narcissus, another thing I want to point out about this release are the Easter eggs. Because it's me, you know I always do this. I'm not reaching as much as usual here. June actually confirmed in an interview that all the symbols in his video are very intentional. 
and carry deeper meaning, which makes the recurring symbols from 17's work that he uses here feel extra notable. The goldfish, the rose, the box. He would not clarify in the interview, though, more than that about what they mean. So I will continue to speculate for you on episodes of 17 Talk. There's another shameless plug for you. He also, in that interview, gave a fun fact, saying that a bunch of bugs flocked to the set because there was a lot of lighting and areas with lots of fire. So, insert June bug jokes here. My shout of the day then goes to Limbo. Excellent storytelling that just deserved its own moment to stop and appreciate. Now let's get to the news, because camp was chaos. You've probably heard some of this already, but here's the full rundown of what we know about what happened at camp. K-A-M-P. First of all, though, right off the bat, I just want to say, please stop comparing every festival that goes wrong to Fire Festival. It is so tired at this point and doesn't even apply the same. It's conflating way too many events to call everyone Fire Fest level drama. Because as interesting as this issue is with camp, people were not stranded overnight in tents without food and water. It's not the same thing at all. So let's, let's calm down with the Fire Fest comparisons. But there were some yikes details about camp that honestly I kind of saw coming, and I'll explain why in a minute. First of all, camp actually has been a success in Singapore. This is just new to LA. It's a two-day event. This first one was set for the Rose Bowl, October 15th and 16th. Build is a, quote, premium K-pop music experience, unquote, basically a rival K-Con, trying to be a different kind of K-Con, a K-culture festival in fall. There was a stacked lineup on deck for an event starting in the early afternoon with performers well into the night. Kai, Masta X, Zion T, Lapolis, Jun Somi, Taeyeon, Bam Bam, all of those example acts I just listed pulled out of the lineup last minute. At first, honestly, I wasn't buying the excuse of visa issues. To me, visa issue sounds like what you say when you don't want to admit your event had low ticket sales. So you say there was an issue getting the artists here, not there was an issue getting an audience here. But then it became clear, oh, wait, it really literally is a visa issue because every single artist from different companies who had dropped out of this were citing that reason. And all of them were squarely putting the blame on camp saying we did everything we were supposed to, we provided the paperwork, the payments, camp is the one that dropped the ball, did not finish up the visa approval process for this trip. So all those statements said, due to that reason, out of our control, we have to cancel their appearances here. Things did not help, reputation-wise, when people who had showed up early that Saturday afternoon when the events kicked off posted to social media showing the incredibly small turnout. The Rose Bowl was like, if I'm being generous, a tenth full. Really, not even just scattered seats empty. Whole giant chunks of the stadium, the arena, were empty. I will note, though, those videos obviously went viral because it's kind of jarring, like, wow, that was low turnout. But also keep in mind, a lot of that was taken before the crowds came, early in the afternoon still. And the footage I saw from later in the day and at night, really, the venue was more full by then. Still quite noticeably empty, big gaps, but not the same extent. It did fill in a bit more. And it's possible they also had people who had gotten seats way in the back moved up to the front because they want it to look visually more full. So sometimes when a show's pretty empty, they'll do that. The event was wrapped in some confusion and miscommunication and just frankly poor management and marketing. There wasn't much marketing period for this event, and the website this weekend, every time I checked, was not new. Had changed nothing. So every time an artist dropped out of the lineup, they were still featured on the homepage as being in the lineup. The site was pretty bare bones too, not much there. Really not very helpful. And to top things off, Saturday night, it was raining. There was a lot of confusion because the name got some people confused, because actually camping was not allowed at all. You had to leave after the event. And it would make sense to get frustrated because they had a no re-entry policy. So if you came at like 2 p.m. and you wanted to leave for a while, come back for the nighttime events, you wouldn't be allowed back in. So either stay well into the night or get out and don't come back. So the weather plus that no return policy did not help make this sound appealing. There was also confusion over the refund policy. At first, camp had to field question after question about, is this whole event canceled? And they were like, no, no, we're still going to make this happen. 
so they promised refunds of 50% if you were a two-day ticket holder. If you bought a one-day ticket, they said you could get a full refund. Interestingly, they said getting a refund, that info, will be emailed to you, so check your email. Rather than say, you take the initiative, reach out to us, it was, we will reach out to you, don't worry. And that statement said, quote, please contact us for further inquiries, unquote, without specifying what they meant by where or how to do that. They made the deadline for requesting your refund that day, October 15th at noon. There were artists who did show up, and honestly, as much as people seem really ticked off, they also did post about, well, it was weird, but we had a good time. At the end of the day, they were glad they went. They got to see Momoland, Icon, P1 Harmony, Super Junior, some with extended set times. So was it a success? Probably not in the eyes of the people who created this and set up Camp LA. The reason I think it kind of relatively flopped is for a couple different reasons. One is that I agree the marketing just was not what it should have been. It was pretty weak. Another variable is the website's lack of transparency, lack of substance, period. People didn't really know what they're going for. They're billing themselves as a whole K-culture festival without specifying what makes them different from like a K-Con. Another thing is that I don't know if anything could ever top K-Con. There are a lot of copycat attempts that fail. But there are a lot of attempts to have some sort of new iteration of basically the same as KCON. And they always kind of flop. I also think this event was billed as the ultimate experience, not only without telling you why, making the case more persuasive, but also making it seem like FOMO, like you would have FOMO looking at the promo. Because at least that's what Firefest had going for it. Firefest was worse, obviously, but I'm just saying in this one case, they knew how to instill FOMO in you when you saw the ads for the event with the A-list stars dancing on the beach, hearing great music all night long. This FOMO basically wasn't there because KCON is still happening. It's KCON Japan time right now. KCON is continuing to go country to country. It's not like after August people were like, great, now we have to wait a whole year for the buzz of KCON to come back. No, it keeps coming, just traveling to different places. But we're still to this day, as I record this, getting YouTube footage and new uploads on social media from KCON accounts, from KCON Japan and other stuff. Backstage clips, performance clips, etc. So the sadness about KCON ending that we could curb, supposedly, by attending camp, not really an issue. They answered an unraised issue. I also think fall festivals in general are much riskier to try to pull off. September's a bit safer, but into October, honestly, probably a very risky month. People have just spent so much money over the summer, seeing all the summer tours, and going to KCON itself. Now they're back in work, school, etc. They just spent their vacation time, it's back to work or school, so they're less likely to go to an event from out of town if they're not from there. And people are less likely to get tickets for an outdoor event in October if they really stretch to afford it because they may think it's not worth the risk. The 50-50 chance of bad weather, then I'll have spent that money for nothing. And even if it's got a hood over the venue, I'm just saying, to be out and about at a festival in the rain, whether it's indoors or not, it's just not the same in fall weather. When it's beautiful and bright and hot and sunny, now that's the festival vibe. So October was not ideal, the marketing wasn't ideal, and someone did drop the ball with the visas. I predicted this event would have low ticket sales, which it did for those reasons, I think. The vagueness about what you were buying a ticket for, which honestly, I also think is part of the reason the sales for tickets to the KCON tour, the stops in different cities, were underwhelming. Because it's hard to commit to spending that money if you don't really know what you're getting. You don't know how long your favorite artist is going to be on stage. You don't know last minute if one of them will drop out. You don't know what the event is when it bills itself as more than just a concert. What does that mean? So people didn't know what they were getting into. So again, I did predict low ticket sales. What I did not predict was this visa issue. That is really major. I guess I'm going against my own word here and comparing it to Firefest, but I'm just saying any type of event where things go south don't go as you'd hoped. An underlying issue with all of it, an underlying moral of the story, is that these events take so much time to plan. 
you really can't just slap together any kind of big event. It is so much more than it sounds. People think, how hard could it be to do all this planning? And then it happens and things go south because when you condense your timeline too much for this stuff, then you're like at the last minute realizing all the issues you hadn't assigned to a certain person who's doing what tasks on what deadlines. It's a mad rush at the last minute to finish and it doesn't get finished. And sometimes what you fail to make time to do are the most vital stuff. It just takes way more work, I think, than people understand. Lollapalooza, Coachella, all that stuff, there's a reason those are just annual. They're already planning for next year. I mean, the When We Were Young Fest, the pop punk dream show this fall, is already planning their acts for 2023. Already announced a couple, too. So that teasing and announcement indicating they've been working on this, thinking about this for a long time. I don't know if that level of planning went into this. So that's my read of what happened. And again, all in all though, the people who did show up seemed to enjoy themselves. And that is one thing about K-pop is, even if a show goes haywire, the concert crowds at K-pop shows, really special, always make the most of it, always a good attitude about it, no matter what. If you're listening to the show and you worked at camp or went yourself, feel free to share your experience with me. I'll make that the question of the day. You can reply directly in Spotify if that's where you're listening. Otherwise, you can message me on socials. Would love your input. Might share it on the show in the future. Your read on the situation. What are people getting right or wrong about? How chaotic or how fun it was? Let me know what you think. But now, let's move into the next story. We've got a lot of big news, J-pop fans. Johnny's and Associates, basically the NCT of J-pop, structurally, conglomeration-wise. Maybe it's better to say the Disney of J-pop. Anyway, they're huge. They are launching Travis Japan internationally. The international debut taking place October 28th. This group will be heavily promoted worldwide and especially in the West. This is a group who has appeared on America's Got Talent, World of Dance, They actually have been around since 2012, when they were formed by Travis Payne, hence the name Travis Japan. They have now signed a deal that's a partnership with Capital Music and Universal Music Group. It's a big moment for Japanese stars when it comes to Netflix as well. Hikaru Utada's songs are becoming the theme of a new show. It's a romantic drama called First Love that incorporates the ideas, the inspiration behind the song First Love from 1999 and the song Hatsukoi from 2018. A teaser trailer was a part of Netflix's Tadum event last month, and here's part of the synopsis. Quote, two teenagers fall in love for the first time in the late 90s. Two decades later, one is about to get engaged while the other is divorced with a teenage son who is falling in love for the first time, unquote. And more J-pop news, J-pop metaverse-related news, Hatsune Miku, my favorite Vocaloid, she's so cute as always, in Fall Guys. She has joined the free mobile game. Now for some K-pop metaverse updates. And if this topic leaves you groaning, sorry, it's a big part of culture now, I'd be remiss not to cover it. I'll make it quick and painless. Espa launched a set of NFTs with Blake Catherine, a Web3 focused artist, Metaverse Creations, previously having worked with Paris Hilton, Jimmy Choo. The goal of this new collection, called iGirls, I A E, like their music video universe, is to quote, reflect female artists pushing the boundaries of what's possible, blurring the lines between real and virtual, to create a new kind of fandom, unquote. The digital auction began October 13th and ends the 21st. The collection went on display in Sotheby's Gallery, both in New York and Hong Kong. This is actually kind of three collections, with three separate drops. Drop one, open, meaning no limit on who can buy the NFT. It can be minted for infinite customers. Part two is more exclusive, 32 options. They're called altars. The altars are available and come with voice recordings and a signed autograph for the highest bidder. Part 3 is called Dream Space. There's only one, one customer for a -a one-of-a-kind piece that comes with a video recording and a virtual meet and greet with Blake Catherine, the designer, and an all-expense paid trip to Seoul to meet Espa and go to their concert. That's what makes this, honestly, way cooler than just an NFT drop, because it really is both that virtual stuff and the real parts of being a fan. It's real-world prizes, too. That's how you get new people into the metaverse. You incorporate real-world elements. 
Now Hybe is a company going in reverse, taking real world stuff, and now joining it with the digital. They have started this campaign, putting their artists in the digital collectible platform Momentica. This is the long-discussed Dunamu and Hybe company partnership. The one that initially was met with backlash because collectibles on the blockchain are so environmentally damaging. So much carbon emission from this stuff. This is the one, however, that after fan backlash, they decided to do it with what they call sustainable blockchain technology. I'm still skeptical about the science there, but they're trying, I guess. It sounds like, basically, they're using Momentica for creating their own version of the blockchain, like they use Weverse as their own Twitter in a way. It's a high artist exclusive goal. Last announcement on this topic, P1 Harmony have joined Jemmy as Gemstar characters in that metaverse. Meanwhile, some big real-world stories to discuss. Stars behaving badly. Rapper Noel was just sentenced for his drunk driving incident that took place 13 months ago. He was just sentenced to a year in prison because of basically not just drunk driving and crashing, but then refusing the breathalyzer test. Shin Hua's Shin Hyesun was arrested just the other day after refusing to take a breathalyzer test. He was also, when he was stopped around 1.40 a.m., caught driving a stolen vehicle. He was actually caught on a DUI before, back in 2007, this time caught at the same time with a stolen car. Ho Chan from Victin was recently caught drunk driving and announced his departure from the group shortly afterwards. At first, he issued a very lengthy apology, as did his company, both saying that he was committed to learning from this, committed to cooperating with the police investigation, and would just accept his punishment and try to move on with his life while on temporary absence from the group, undetermined future in the group. But he's decided, ultimately, this is too much negative press toward the group when the other members are innocent of that and don't deserve it. So he's decided, after much discussion, to just depart the group officially. His punishment and what the investigation uncovers, TBD, that I'll keep you posted. Raven, from One Us, is also on a leave of absence while RBW Entertainment investigates. Some recent internet rumors online. I don't want to talk about the rumors online because big trigger warning there and I can't go there. But severe allegations against him that they are looking into right now. That's what they stress in their statement, that they're still looking into it as of recording time. And they said if the claims are false, they will pursue legal action against people posting those malicious rumors online about him. They also stressed in the statement that the other One Us members had no idea. Don't drag them into this. They were irrelevant to this situation. They are just as confused and sad as everyone else finding out. Lastly, in the behaving badly category, someone, Jesse, I guess is being managed by. Jessie has been posting some Instagram stories from her European tour concerning vague statements about, quote, this man who, quote, keeps stranding her. Apparently, she's just been kind of left to her own devices in Europe, paying for finding her own travel, hotel accommodations, just keeps getting stranded, waiting for this man, whoever it is, to show up and facilitate more. So as she presumably makes money for this guy's paycheck, he also makes her pay up for her own tour travel. She also vented a bit about this frustrating situation on stage at some shows, determined to finish the tour though, keeps stating how she's both frustrated and determined by this to be there for her fans. So please show up for her if you are in Europe. And man, I really hope she either goes back to P Nation, where they treated her better than whoever this guy is, or starts her own company, does her own thing. Something's gotta give. Really just hoping for the best for her. Some more concerning news, then I'll get to lighter stuff. Two different artists just canceled their tours, both citing unforeseen circumstances. Jamie canceled her North American tour a week before it was set to start. She cited an unforeseen scheduling issue. She will have this tour just postponed for a TBA date. Then there's Amber Liu, who is set to perform in LA soon, and London and Paris. She cites her upcoming album, Production Delays, as the reason for the hold, but then went on to say in her statement, many unseen factors are affecting this decision. Although, just a PSA, she is still set for the New York Metamoon Fest next month. She confirmed that herself. 
So both Janie and Amber, a little vague and confusing about the sudden indefinite postponements. Again, I wonder if it's partly the issue is a fall tour. Announcing a tour after the big, busy season of touring, less people are free to travel to shows, have the money to keep going to shows. For the year, it's just kind of wrapping up. But that's just my thought. It could just be they're totally different incidents, but I found the timing interesting. It could just reflect a bigger trend. Other show news, due to COVID, Stray Kids had had to postpone a couple shows on their tour, which have now been rescheduled in Atlanta and Fort Worth for March 2023. If you have questions, see Live Nation for details. Key is having a new Beyond Live show at 16 o'clock, October 23rd. K-Flex, a mega concert, is coming to the O2 Arena in London. Tickets are out now for this November 20th event, where you can see Weekly, Winner, Pentagon, AB6, Unite, VVs, and Billy. Golden Child are coming back for another round of Meet and Live tour dates, starting in Brazil, November 25th, then Newark, Toronto, Houston, San Juan, Orlando, Monterey, Guadalajara, and closing in Mexico City, December 11th. Check out Studio PAV's social media for more. Lastly, SF9 announced a winter tour. Starts in Seoul, November 18th. We'll come to New York, Chicago, December 2nd, Dallas, Denver, and then LA, December 10th. I'm just going to speak something into existence. The Jingle Ball, Jingle Bash lineups have no K-pop as of recording time, but previously they have had last-minute K-pop additions to the lineups because if ticket sales aren't going well, that's sure a way to boost those. And again, I'm just speaking into existence, totally speculating. I don't have the inside scoop on this, but N hyphen are really stressing on this U.S. tour. They were reiterating that they'll be back very soon in the States. So if there's a last-minute K-pop addition to a lineup, like for the B96 bash in Chicago, maybe it's in hyphen? Just throwing that out there. Or NCT, because I'm still bitter. They miss Chicago on the world tour, despite one of them being from Chicago. Yes, I will be bitter about this until the end of time. But maybe they're coming to the Jingle Bash and making up for it? I don't know. You're probably thinking now, Hope, you're pretty deep into this episode and have still not addressed the biggest story in a long, long time. I know, but now I will address it. Let's talk about it. The elephant in the room. BTS are officially on a group hiatus until around 2025. To you non-K-pop fans, that's like no time at all. To K-pop fans, that's like 30 years of not releasing stuff. They have all, all seven, decided to enlist in the military. Remember we've talked about before on the show, the endless back and forth government officials were having about who should get an exemption from the mandate of enlisting in the military because they've also offered a lot to the country in other ways, culturally, spreading Korean culture and interest. But man, they really are very, very, very specific and narrow about who can get an exemption. They really don't like to answer that question. Basically, if you don't win an Olympic gold medal or an equivalent, there's no way you get the exemption granted. Very limited occasions. They have been debating BTS's exceptional circumstances and reach in spreading Korean culture forever. Infinite articles about the latest development in the debate. And it ended kind of like if it were a TV show, like a cop-out script writing in the end, because it sounds like they just kind of threw their hands up and said, we can't reach a consensus. We can't get a unanimous vote on if they should be allowed to be exempt or not. It sounds like they just sort of left it up to Hive and BTS themselves to decide if they want to pursue an exemption. None of them did. They all decided to do it fully, too, on time. So even Jin, who had had a deferral until the end of the year, he's waived that. So he will actually enter soon after releasing some solo music he prepared in October. The timing of when each member will do their required military time still TBD, but I'll keep you posted, of course, when that info becomes public, if it ever does. The members who are not serving at that moment will be still pursuing solo endeavors. The statement makes abundantly clear that this is not supposed to be taken as a disbandment. This is a pause, basically what they've been on, a bit of a hiatus, until they're done with these other moments. Then the next chapter of their life will be back as BTS. They are not going anywhere, they're just going different places for the moment. 
I don't want to spend too much time sharing my take on this because I frankly think the ultimate takes, if you want to call them that, should come from South Koreans. And I really don't have that mindset to give an educated take on this decision because in the USA, enlisting is totally optional. And so it's kind of unfamiliar to me, hard for Americans like me to wrap our brains around the concept of growing up with the assumption you are surely going to enlist when you're older. Our patriotism is not wrapped up in that the same way. And so I don't know the full extent of how deep fulfilling this obligation means to them and other South Koreans. I can imagine it's a very, very important, prideful thing. I will say I'm not surprised. I really did think even if they were offered an exemption, they would ultimately say no, knowing how they are, how they always want to follow the rules and do what they can to support South Korea. I just feel like they would feel like it was a cop-out not to do this for their country. And the wording of the statement confirming the news says as much. What I am a little surprised about is how quick this announcement came. Yes, it was an endless will they or won't they, but also it was quicker than I thought because of that deferral Jin had for the end of the year. So I assumed the official word about the others would also come nearer to the end of the year. So that's what's disappointing to me, not the news itself. I'm proud of them, I'll support them, I'll be waiting for them, I'll miss them, but I will support their decision here. My issue is with the timing just being so unexpected. Not a great way to wake up and start your week, that's for sure. The small upside here, a recent letter to shareholders confirmed Hyde plans to release, quote, four new teams in 2023 from Korea, Japan, and the U.S., unquote. Hybe is definitely, during this BTS break, going to be expanding the quantity of groups they have, the quantity of music we get. We're still in for a lot of exciting earworms from this really cool company. BTS laid a groundwork that other artists are going to use to find their own voices at the company, and that's going to be very exciting to hear. In somewhat less emotional BTS news, this was really interesting to hear. HYBE actually lost a trademark request. They wanted to trademark member V's phrase, Borahe. That's what he used during that 2016 fan meeting when he laid out his view on the color purple, what it means to him to love someone like purple, to purple them, purple the last color in the rainbow, the most special. And Borahe is basically the word he uses to summarize that whole I purple you story. Hype actually started vying for this copyright back in September 2020 when a cosmetics company, Lala Lee's, tried to trademark it. And BTS fans found out Borahe was being used. The backlash prompted Hype to take matters into their own hands and decide to try to win in court. Now that's going to bat for the fans. The office responsible for granting or denying these requests, KIPO, cited, quote, the principles of good faith, unquote, as the reason to deny the request to trademark Borahe. Now, before you get upset, it's actually kind of a sweet reason. They explicitly say in their ruling that if anyone trademarks this, it should be V, not Hybe, not his company, just him as an individual, because this is his personal phrase. I know they're talking just legally, that makes sense, but also kind of morally, that's really sweet. Let him keep the phrase. Don't let a corporation take the phrase from him. Gotta love that. Speaking of V, I don't really like to spend too much time dwelling on dating rumors and relationship statuses in K-pop because like agencies have been saying more and more now, we're gonna not comment because it's their personal life and that shouldn't be the news. Let's focus on their music. So I'm following their lead and just kind of not playing into that gossip. I also prefer to focus on news stories that I can verify and dating rumors are just rumors. So the one exception is Hyuna and Dawn, OTP. We'll talk about them all day long. I hesitated to talk about the whole rumor about V dating Jenny from Blackpink, but there is serious news that makes it more newsworthy, I think, and that is that someone leaked Jenny's personal pictures of her on dates with him. YG Entertainment recently issued a statement confirming they have police on the case to determine who leaked it. We'll keep you posted on that. Miscellaneous BTS updates. Their boss, Mr. Bang, is only the 13th person to ever have a customized donation fund, thanks to his massive contributions to the community chest of Korea. 
The textile company Colin Industries FNC released an upcycled bag collection featuring reused pieces from BTS's stage outfits. This is part of a partnership with the fashion brand Recod that came out in late September. BTS's song Butter now joins their song Dynamite as the only songs by Korean artists on Spotify to ever reach a billion streams. Speaking of making social media history, Jimin did so on his birthday. For the third year in a row, he's still the only person to ever have 28 different keywords and hashtags with his name in them on the Twitter Worldwide Trends Chart simultaneously. Happy belated birthday, by the way. We love Libra season. Yeah, I said it. Some of you will be mad at me for that, but whatever. Go Libras. And BTS's album, Map of the Soul 7, made it to 25th place on Rolling Stone's list of the 50 greatest concept albums of all time. Their concept then was the self, the ego id superego, your public persona versus your shadow, your true self trying to come through the facade. I agree with their decision. I would also have put on there more from other artists, honestly. Even more than BTS, I think. Quite a few K-pop artists have created concept albums, and I just love that. Really wish more artists would still do that. Release an album with one main storyline, where you have to listen to it in order. I mean, DPR Ian's Mido, I would argue, counts. I would also argue some of Taemin's stuff would count. That's another question of the day. What K-pop releases do you think should be considered a concept album in the first place? And then two, what are the greatest concept albums from Korea of all time, from Korean artists? Let's move on to some award show news. At the APAN Star Awards, the K-pop label award went to Kane Daniels' company, Connect Entertainment. And Park Jae-chan from DKZ was one of the best couple winners for his acting in Semantic Error. For the fifth year in a row, BTS won the grand prize at the FACT Music Awards, and they won seven trophies total. Meanwhile, the Bonsain Awards went to ATs, The Boys, BTS, G-Idol, ITZY, IVE, Kane Daniel, Lim Yun-Woon, NCT Dream, Psy, Stray Kids, Treasure, and TXT. Other big award wins went to NCT Dream, ATs, BTS, Poin Chi Yul, Lim Yun Woon, Jin on his own, Stray Kids, Psy, Kepler, TNX, Im Ho Joon, Yun Tak, New Jeans, Ive, and Le Seraphim. The European Music Award nominees are here, with Blackpink nominated in four categories Best Video, Best Metaverse Performance, BTS's performance in that list as well, Biggest Fans, and Best K pop. The best K-pop category includes Lisa as a soloist and Blackpink, plus BTS, Seventeen, ITZY, and TWICE. Blackpink are against BTS, Nicki Minaj, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, and Harry Styles for biggest fans. That sounds heated. Seventeen have a Best New nomination and a Best Push nomination. And look, I'm all for 17 winning everything, but not sure how exciting it is to say, woo, congrats, we won Best Push, or Best New, that's the whole title. The nominees for Best Asia Act, Maymay and Trada, Sylvie, The Rampage, TXT, and Nikki. It's going to be The Rampage or TXT winning, just throwing that out there. Then there are the American Music Award nominees. Favorite K-pop is a brand new category this year, including TXT, BTS, Blackpink, Seventeen, and Twice. I bet Blackpink or BTS will win. Go ahead and applaud my incredible prediction skills now. BTS are also in the favorite pop duo or group category. Voting starts for the AMAs November 1st. The show airs November 20th, 7 p.m. Central on ABC. Now, so many rapid-fire headlines I want to get to, so strap in, get ready for a big ride, because there is so much. Nam Dohyun from BAE173 is suffering from COVID after effects and will take a break to focus on recovery. Meanwhile, Eun Shae from Lee Seraphim had to miss the FACT Music Awards due to COVID. K-pop stars have continued to attend so many Fashion Month shows, at Paris Fashion Week's Miu Miu show, Jenny was beside Kristen Stewart, my goodness iconic, plus Yuna from Girls' Generation was there, as was Wanyun from IVE. At Ferragamo, Cheyun from Twice, at Dior, Jisoo, and Astro's Unwoo, 
Aspa went to the Givenchy show as ambassadors. JB was at Isabel Marant. G Dragon was kind of everywhere, but didn't really post much about it. Just on Instagram stories, he was really chaotic in the best way. Mark Twan and Rose were at Saint Laurent. Yugium at the Onitsuka Tiger Show. Soul fashion attendees include Huda, Juhani, Jin Jin from Astro, June in the Eight from Seventeen, many, many more. And speaking of Seventeen, they have released a lot on YouTube lately to catch up on. The behind the scenes limbo video and dance practice video, Soon Guan's Harry Styles as it was cover, and a behind the scenes video about it, freaking out of her both still. And the highlight medley for their November Japanese release, Dream. They also, starting October 27th, have a new photo book out called The Name 17. They knew we'd say it, and they put it on a book. They also added Asia dates to their Be the Sun World Tour for November and December. A Pink's Cho Ron got into a car accident on the way home from practice, suffering a minor cervical spine injury. She first tried to power through it to keep up her promo schedule, but eventually then decided to go on a break due to a flare-up. Really hope when she tried to power through, it was not because of agency pressure. SF9 were also recently in a car accident, although none were injured. They were actually out at a rest stop when someone crashed into their car, scratching it. They send out a statement for the sake of transparency about what happened to excuse their absence. They were late for the National Sports Fest closing ceremony they were set to perform at. An update on a story I talked about last time on the show, Lee Soo Mian and his ties to this company like planning, SM Entertainment did ultimately agree to go through with severing ties with like planning. Their licensing deal will not be renewed, so it expires December 31st. This follows an SM Entertainment Board of Directors meeting and has been celebrated news by investors in SM Entertainment, like Align Partners. T1419 are going through a makeover. Their name is now TFN. It's time for a fresh start. Their name used to be referring to their ages, teenage 1419. Now they want to be TFN to stand for Try For New, representing their new image and goal. Epex revealed their official light stick design, 1OK Rock, featured on MTV's Fresh Out Live, NCT 127 was on GMA, plus became the first K-pop group to ever be on the new show, The Jennifer Hudson Show. They also just became only the eighth artist in history to have a show at Seoul's Olympic Stadium. I'm showing great restraint by not reiterating how bitter I am they didn't go to Chicago on tour again. Oops, just did no restraint there. Lee Chaiming is the latest MC to join Wanyan on Music Bank. And Hyphen performed as part of the Grammy Museum's Global Spin Series, October 5th. And Mix are the new reps for clothing brand Low. New Jeans now rep two fashion labels, 5252 and Muzinsa. Congrats to Eddie Nam, Eric Nam's brother, for his new baby boy, Grayson. All four Day 6 members have renewed their contracts with JYP Entertainment. Nam Woo Hyun from Infinite is the last of the members of the group to part ways with Willem Entertainment after 14 years with them. As of recording time, not confirmed, but suspected that Woods is joining IU's company, EDEM Entertainment. Ki Hui Hyun from Daya signed with Haikon Entertainment to focus on acting. Bowman from Golden Child, on his time off, was golfing, then got hit in the head with a golf club, and suffered a facial fracture requiring surgery, although he is on the mend. No word yet on if this affects his participation in the upcoming tour dates. Ravi is enlisting October 27th as a public service worker. Hassan Woon had a postponed enlistment. It was set to be earlier, but then he got COVID, so now he'll enlist October 24th. Here's a fun throwback. Go Wuri from Rainbow got married. Her bandmates reunited. There was a Rainbow reunion. Yoon Sul from the newly rebranded Peach A got married just a week before the group's re-debut. Shotaro from NCT is the new face of MAC Cosmetics Japan. Speaking of being new reps from NCT, Mark Lee is now repping Polo Ralph Lauren. 
The G.O.D. members joined Instagram and are teasing a comeback. A new Blackpink and Casetify collection is here October 25th. Stray Kids sold over 1.3 million copies of Maxident in its first day. And it was a personal best for them when it comes to stock pre-orders with over 2.2 million. Other stock pre-order milestones, over 700,000 for G Idol's I Love and over 600,000 for Anti-Fragile by Le Seraphim. Over 600 now, and the first Le Seraphim album had 270,000. Blackpink's Born Pink, in its first week, sold 1.54 million copies, the highest one-week sales for a K-pop girl group in history. They also made history, debuting at number one on the Billboard 200 albums chart and becoming the first number one girl group album in the chart's history since 2008. Also, Pink Venom reached 200 million streams on Spotify, and they broke their own record to have the fastest song to do that, taking only 42 days. Ready for Love reached 100 million views, and the Pink Venom dance practice video, also 100 million. The number of regions some new releases topped iTunes in. Mamamoo, Mike On, 10. Treasure, The Second Step, Chapter 2, 15. Dreamcatcher, Apocalypse, Follow Us, 21. Sulgi, 28 Reasons, 30. Schumann, Brand New, 33. And Crush and J-Hope's Rush Hour, 41. My Universe by BTS and Coldplay is certified platinum in the U.S. Chanyeol and Punch's Stay With Me is now officially the only OST video to reach 400 million views ever. Well deserved. More view count milestones. 20 million on Crush and J-Hope's Rush Hour. 50 million on Mix with Dice. 100 million Ives After Like for Eve's Test Me and Stray Kids' Elevator. 200 million Got 7's Never Ever and Chen and Punches every time. And 300 million on Rosé's On the Ground. Thank you all so much for tuning in as always. That was so much news to get to. Thanks for being there for the ride. And real quick, your action item. Here are some places where you could donate and support to help Hurricane Ian victims. 1SC Fund, Maria Fund, World Central Kitchen, Volunteer Florida, Feeding Florida, Florida Disaster Fund, and VOAD, the Puerto Rican National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. Stay safe, thanks again, and I'll talk to you all again soon. Bye everybody!